All right, well, hey, everybody, welcome to Eaglebrook Church. Really good to have you with us today. If you're at one of our campuses, we're grateful for you. If you're watching this message online, I was just talking to people this week. One of them lives in Florida, another one lives in Arizona, and they got connected to our church through a family member, and boy, they just love it. I mean, they just consider this to be their church, and they're watching in Florida and Arizona, which you're brilliant, so way to go. Uh, on that. Uh, we are in the fifth and final week of a series called My Flippin' Family. Here's the deal. My family has issues. Your family has issues. And oftentimes it's those issues that make us want to flip our family, like some people flip houses. But here's what God wants to do. God wants to build your family. God wants to restore your family. And that's what this series has been all about. So far, we've covered the topics of dating, parenting, sex, and divorce. If you missed any of those, I'd encourage you to go back and watch them online. But today's message is titled Fixer Upper. Fixer Upper is a popular TV show on HDTV starring the married couple Chip and Joanna Gaines. And I don't even feel like I need to say that, but there was one person on our leadership team who didn't know what Fixer Upper was. They were like, Chip, what? Wood Chip? What are you talking about? I'm like, back under your rock. It's a super popular show on HGTV, okay? So we're all on the same page now, hopefully, on that. It's actually one of the shows that my wife and I enjoy watching together. She likes to see how Joanna designs and decorates the houses. I just think Chip is really funny. But if you ever watch the show, you know that the format is kind of the same for most episodes. The way it works is there's a couple or a person who chooses between three rundown houses. Once they pick which house they want to purchase, that's when Chip and Joanna go to work. Chip goes on demo day and just knocks the whole thing apart. Then there's always a moment when Chip and Joanna figure out that something that they didn't think was going to cost that much is actually going to cost way more than they thought. And then they fight about who has to call the client and deliver the bad news. Then there's always the night when Joanna has to stay up late decorating but her kids will come beforehand and give her like a donut and she'll go like, just seeing their little faces gives me the strength to get through the night. It's like every show is kind of the same. But what's interesting about the show is it's fascinating to see the transformation that can take place in a house. It's not just houses that can be transformed. It's not just houses that can be brought back to life. Marriages can as well. And that's the topic of today's message. Now, I need to begin today with a confession. And I don't normally like to do this uh, from this platform. It's uh, kind of hard for me to talk about this publicly, honestly. But around Christmas time, my wife started to develop an addiction. And it wasn't a culturally acceptable addiction, like coffee or something like that. It was, it was actually one of the embarrassing ones. And I never saw this coming. We've been married for 16 years. And so it's been really hard for me to watch someone who I respect and love so much spiral into such a dark place. But right around Christmas time, my wife started to record and watch every Hallmark Christmas movie. <laughs> Would you pray for us? <laughs> my wife is 37 years old. She's too young to watch Hallmark Christmas movies. My mom watches Hallmark Christmas movies. Now, I mentioned to you that every Fixer Upper episode is kind of the same. Well, so is every Hallmark Christmas movie, except they're terrible. <laughs> Within the first three minutes, you can tell which two people are going to get together. In fact, one time I accidentally deleted one of my wife's Hallmark Christmas movies, and she got so mad, which is like clearly addictive behavior, because she was just so angry. And she goes, well... How am I going to find out how the movie ends now? I said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, I will tell you exactly how that movie is going to end. There's going to be one person who's cynical about Christmas, and they hate everything Christmas. And they're going to get together with the person who loves Christmas and just has Christmas spirit oozing out of them. I said, in between, they're going to go ice skating, they're going to have a snowball fight or they're going to go to a tree farm. They're going to have hot chocolate or apple cider and they're going to dig into this cynic's childhood to find out why he hates Christmas or why she hates Christmas so much. I said, then there's going to be an interrupted kiss where they're going to start to kiss one and someone's going to walk in the room and you're going to get so worried. You're going to go, oh no, 
this movie's going to end and they're never going to kiss. I said, don't you worry. At the very end of that movie, those two people are going to kiss. And as they are kissing, it's going to begin to snow. And as it's snowing, they're going to look up like they've never seen snow before. And they're going to, and they're going to start laughing. And they're going to look at each other, and then they're going to kiss again. And that's how the movie's going to end. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just saved you 12 hours of your life next December, okay? You, th you remember me around Christmas time next year, okay? I expect a card at least from every one of you for that gift I just gave. Now, here's the thing about every Hallmark Christmas movie. They end with a kiss with it snowing. They never show them doing the laundry. They never show them arguing about whose in-law's house they're going to go to for Christmas or whose in-laws they spend more time with. They never show them getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to care for a sick kid. There's no bills, there's no budgets, there's no babies. There's no working two jobs and trying to finish grad school. There's no flannel pajamas and mud masks. There's no messes to clean up and dishes to put away. It's just a kiss while it's snowing. Problem is, in real life, that's not how it works, is it? It doesn't end with a kiss, that's usually just the beginning. After that, you get everything that I just mentioned. And what happens for some people is when they start to enter into those things, they look around and they go, wait a minute, what's wrong with our marriage? I mean, what's wrong with us? We used to go on dates. We used to kiss when it was snowing outside. We used to talk to each other late at night on the phone. And we'd play little games like, okay, I'm going to hang up now. Let's hang up at the same time. One, two, three. I still hear you. You're still there. I hear you. And it's just, we would do these silly things. And now we're just stressed. We're just tired. We fight about things that we never used to fight about before. What is wrong with our marriage? And if you begin to feel that way, you start to wonder, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to just flip this marriage for a new one. Maybe we don't love each other, or we never loved each other, or maybe, maybe I married the wrong person. Here's what I want to say to you today. You did not marry the wrong person. No matter how much your marriage feels like it's crumbling, and for some of us, that's where you're at, that you feel like your marriage is just kind of falling apart these days, even if you feel that way, I am telling you, God can fix it up. And when he does, it will be more beautiful with more character and more history than any other marriage that you could ever have. You may have put some walls up between the two of you, but God can knock those down and enlarge your love. You may have some nicks and scratches in your past, but God can sand those down and restore your marriage to its original beauty. Some of us here need a major demo day. Others of us just simply need a fresh coat of paint on our marriage. We just need a fresh coat of paint and some fresh carpet. But no matter where you're at in your marriage right now, I hope you leave this message believing that God can fix it up. That if you will begin to put these principles into place, that you will begin to move towards each other and towards God, that he can fix your marriage. In Proverbs 5.18 Solomon, who's considered to be one of the wisest men who's ever lived, he's giving some advice to his son. And here's what he says to his son. He says, let your wife be a fountain of blessing to you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now, he's speaking to his son here, so he says rejoice in the wife of your youth. But if he was speaking to his daughter, he might say rejoice in the husband of your youth. So let me ask you, are you rejoicing in the spouse of your youth? I'm drawn to this word rejoice. To me, it feels like a strong kind of word. I mean, he doesn't say, you know, just put up with the husband of your youth. I mean, I know, I know, but you just got to put up with him. He doesn't say just tolerate the wife of your youth. 
I mean, she's just, but you just got to tolerate it. No, 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 no. He says, you should rejoice. Before I came to Eagle Brook, I worked for seven years with teenagers as a youth pastor. And being a youth pastor is kind of like being a parent. Once you're a youth pastor, you're, you're kind of with them for life. And so I still keep in contact with several kids who were in my youth group. In fact, this past year, a couple that ended up starting to date while they were attending our church, they asked me if I would do a vow renewal ceremony for them. They had been married for 10 years, they had two kids, and for a couple different reasons, they wanted to renew their vows with one another. And I don't normally do weddings anymore, but they got me when the wife said that, she said, when we were dating, you pulled my husband aside at one point, my now husband, and you said to him, guard her heart. And she said, he always remembered that and he always did that. And so we wanted you to be a part of our special day. And I thought that made every middle school all-nighter almost worth it. Not really, it was terrible, but, <laughs> but I couldn't believe that someone actually remembered something I had said and actually did something about it. And so as I stood there on Clearwater Beach with the waves coming in from the ocean behind us, I looked at her husband and now 15 years after they started dating, 10 years into marriage with two kids, I had a new message for him. I said, rejoice in the wife of your youth. And that's my message for you today as well. Rejoice in the wife. Rejoice in the husband of your youth. Here's what the word rejoice means. It means to find joy in them. It means that you focus more on the positives than you do the negatives. It means that you give them the benefit of the doubt. And you remind yourself on a regular basis why you married that person and why you fell in love in the first place. Now, my question is, when Solomon says to his son, rejoice in the wife of your youth, why did he feel necessary to tell him that? I mean, wouldn't you just kind of naturally do that anyway? Well, apparently not, because look at what he says in the next verse. He says, may you always be captivated by her love. And then he asks his son this question. He says, why be captivated, my son, with an immoral woman or embrace the breast of an adulterous woman? For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path that he takes. Solomon is reminding his son that he can't fill up his eyes with his wife if they've already been filled up by another person. And so Solomon's prayer for his son is very simple. He says, may you be captivated by her love. And that's my prayer for you today as well. That you would be captivated by his love. That you would be captivated by her love. But what if you're not? How can you fix up a marriage? Some of us here today, you need a major demo day. I've talked to some of you and you would, you would admit, you know what, we are in a tough spot we need to do some major demolition on our marriage, but you can save it. Others of you would say, you know what, we've got a great marriage, but it's up and down from now and then. We just need a fresh coat of paint on the wall. How do you fix up a marriage? Let me give you three ways. The first one is this. Think about your selfie less and your spousey more. <laughs> we live in the most selfie-centered culture. In fact, in 2015, did you know that more people died while taking a selfie than they did from shark attacks. I mean, I'm a little surprised nobody tried to take a selfie during a shark attack. You know, it's like, hang on, let me get a different angle here. Okay, go. I mean, we live in a selfie-centered kind of culture. But the Bible is so different. The Bible is so radical, and it speaks right into where your marriage is at. Here's what Paul writes in Philippians 2. He says, don't think about your own affairs. Now, that's really hard to do. Most of us wake up in the morning and we're thinking about our to-do list, our work, our affairs. He says, don't think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they are doing. Let me ask you, how interested are you in what your spouse is doing these days? You express interest when you ask them when you communicate that you're interested in what they're doing and you want to have a shared experience of life? 
one of the most dangerous places that any single married couple can get to is when you are living two separate lives. You go to your work, he goes to his. You go on a girl's weekend, he goes hunting. You go out to dinner, he just stays home and watches TV, two separate lives. Now, of course, we want some time apart. We need some time apart. It's okay to have different hobbies from one another. But do you see how dangerous the separate life model is on a marriage? Because what happens is that all you're doing is you're trying to manage a house together. Keep it clean, pay the bills, talk about the schedules, fight about how you parent the kids, fight about who stayed home from work the last time the kids were sick. But you never have these positive connections and interactions. Let me try to illustrate this for you. Some people these days have a marriage that could be kind of illustrated like this. And this is just a, a simple drawing, but they live two separate experiences, two separate friends, separate interests, separate lives. There's no connection points, really. Except maybe there's a kid in here, and maybe there's some bills, and maybe there's a few things that you have to connect on. But for the most part, you're just kind of living two separate lives, you're into your affairs, she's into his. If you're in a marriage like this, it feels like a really lonely place to be. Here's what a healthy marriage can look like, and here's what God wants to do in your marriage. It looks like this. There's some overlap. Now, not perfect overlap, of course. You're two separate people, but there's some shared experiences. There's some shared interests. There's some shared life with one another. Does this describe your marriage right now? And if not, how could you build some points of connection, build some overlap into the marriage that you have? Look what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. He says, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man is actually loving himself when he loves his wife. Now, that's a profound statement. Because people today talk all the time about loving themselves. If you are a husband, one of the ways that you can love yourself is actually by loving your wife. Now, what does that look like? Because I'll ask men, what does it mean to love your wife as you love yourself? And sometimes men will say something like, well, uh, you know, I share the remote once in a while. And I'm like, that's great. I mean, that's, that's a good start, right? You would want the remote shared with you. You share the remote once in a while. That's a fine start. But here's what it means to love your wife as yourself. If I were to go to your wife and I said, what is one thing? Not three, four, five, but just what is one thing that you would love for him to start? What is one thing maybe that you would love for him to stop? What would she say? Do that. If you don't know the answer to that, ask her what the answer to that question is because that's real love. When you begin to give up what you want for what the other person wants, that is real love. This means that for some of you, you should go see a counselor or a pastor this week to talk about the issues in your marriage. Your wife has been saying, hey, we need to go see a counselor. We need to talk through some of these issues. And like most men, you're going, I'm not doing that. I'm not going and talking to a pastor about my problems. And I get it. I'm a pastor. I don't want to go talk to a pastor about my problems, okay? I don't think it's their business. I'm a little embarrassed. I feel stupid. I get all of that. But would you be willing to set aside your pride to save your marriage, to improve your marriage? For some of you, this would mean cutting back on your drinking or maybe cutting it out altogether. For some of you, this would mean getting a hold of your temper and really developing a plan for how you can work on that. For some of you, this would mean becoming a spiritual leader in your home who's the one leading the family to church or is reading God's word and talking about it with people. But if I went to your spouse and I said, hey, what is one thing they would love? How would they respond? Do that. 
Now, ladies, I would say the exact same thing to you. If I went to your husband and I said, what is one thing that he would so want, what would he say? Some of you are like, oh, you know what he would want. <laughs> Not necessarily. I mean, I find that many men, actually what they want is respect. They want to know that their wife believes in them and respects them. They want encouragement. I mean, they get beat down everywhere in life, at work and elsewhere, and they just want a person who's going, man, I'm your biggest fan, and I'm cheering for you all the time. But I spoke on the topic of physical intimacy a couple weeks ago. And afterwards, I got a couple emails from married couples who said, you know, just to be honest, this is a real struggle for us. And so if it's a struggle for you, I just want you to know you're not alone in that. A lot of times we don't talk about this or we don't have the opportunity to know that, that we're not alone, that other people struggle with the same things. But this is the beauty of marriage. You have your whole life together to grow in this area of physical intimacy. And one of the things I noticed is as I corresponded with these couples, I would ask them this question. I would say, how old are your kids? And every one of them was like, well, we got a three-month-old. We've got a six-month-old. We've got a four-year-old. I thought, well, of course you're struggling in this area of life. I mean, if you have little kids and you're trying to build a career and build a family, that's a challenging time in any marriage. You need to hang in there. You need to know that you're going to come out on the other side of this. But the best marriages are the ones when both people are looking to serve one another. Kind of reminds me of lining up for recess. I don't know if this is just a Jason Strand thing or a boy thing, but when I was in third grade and they said, hey, it's time to line up for recess, I'm going to get first in line. Not coming in second. I'm not coming in third. I'm certainly not going to be at the back of the line. I'm going to get six seconds of more of recess than everyone else in the class. And the problem is that some people take that same attitude into marriage. Everything's a competition. Everything's a trying to get first in line. So we fight about who cleans up more and who takes the garbage out more and who puts the kids to bed more often. And we have fights like, well, you just took a break like 10 minutes ago. I saw you sitting over there on your phone. Well, you went out to lunch yesterday with that. Oh, you like you never go out to lunch. And it's just a big competition. It's two people trying to fight to get to the front of the line. Friends, I'm telling you, you can do that. But your marriage will suffer. The best marriages are where both people are running to the back of the line. And they're going, hey, you go first. No, 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 no. I want, I want you to go first. No, you, let me serve you. No, let me serve you. I've told this story before, but author Kyle Eidelman tells a great story in his book, Not a Fan, about a friend of his. And his friend said that he knew his life, wife loved him one day as he was walking down the hallway into their kitchen. His wife was cooking dinner, and at one point, she reached into the fridge, and she grabbed a liter of Pepsi that had been sitting in there for like three weeks. There was just a little bit left. She poured the flat, stale Pepsi into one cup. She then opened a brand new liter of Pepsi and poured the fresh, fizzy Pepsi into a different cup. But this whole time, her back was turned to her husband. She didn't know he was watching her. And so when they sat down for dinner, he thought, I wonder who she's going to give the flat, stale Pepsi to. <laughs> he said, when she put it down at her plate, he said, I've never felt more loved in our marriage. <laughs> Now, I got a kick out of that story because just a few days before I read it, my wife and I were having some Rocky Road ice cream together, and there was one bowl that was freezer burned with lots of nuts, which I don't like, and there was another bowl that was fresh and had lots of marshmallows, which I do like. And I'm not kidding you. As I was walking into the living room, I kept going, her bowl's in your left hand, your bowl's in your right. Her bowl's in your left hand, your bowl's in your right. Because I wanted the fresh bowl with more marshmallows, and I didn't care at all about sticking her with the other one. Now, I'm an only child, so I got a lot of work to do in this area of my life. But I want you to see again what the Bible says about this, because I am telling you, if you could just apply this one verse, I talk to people all the time who are struggling in their marriage, and I think, boy, if you could just apply this one verse, things would turn around. He says, don't be selfish. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
He's basically saying, think about yourself less and your spouse more. If you did that, your marriage would be transformed. Here's the second way that you can begin to fix up a marriage, and it's this. Appreciate the positives, and as to the best of your ability, overlook at least some of the negatives. Appreciate the positives and be willing to overlook some negatives. See, here's the deal. You can always find something about your spouse that's going to disappoint you. And the truth of the matter is, if I ask some of you, what disappoints you about your spouse? Give me five things. 30 seconds, boom, 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 you'd have five. You'd be like, I don't like the way he eats his soup, and I don't like the way he handles money, and and I don't like the way she parents the kids or doesn't put her stuff away. I mean, you would have a list of five just like that. But if I were to ask you, what do you love about your spouse? What are your spouse's strengths? You might fumble with that a little bit. It might take you a little longer to come up with those. You can always find something about your spouse that's going to disappoint you. Kind of reminds me of how some people date. I don't know if you've ever had someone like this, but you get together with them for lunch after they've been on a date, and you'll say, well, you know, how did your date go? And, and she'll say, eh, it wasn't that good. And you're like, well, what's the problem? I thought for sure you guys were just going to totally hit it off. Like, what, what, what was the issue? And she's like, well, well, I saw his bedroom, and well, he had a Star Wars poster. He actually had two Star Wars posters. And I mean, what if we get married and he starts putting a Star Wars poster up in our house? And you're like, really? That's what's going to make you not go on a second date? Like, you know you're going to get married and Chip Gaines, you'll get him hooked on Fixer Upper and Chip Gaines will get him to rip down that poster, tear off the drywall, and find some ship lap behind there in no time. Like, why are you even worried about this? But that's how some people date. They're very picky. Always finding the spot, always finding the fault, always finding the blemish. Problem is when you carry that attitude into your marriage. Look what Paul says in Ephesians 4. He says, be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults. And then here's the key. He says, because of your love. You say, well, why why should I make an allowance for her faults? I mean, come on. Why should I make an allowance for his faults? Here's why. Because of your love. You, if you want a great relationship, you need to put the relationship ahead of their faults, ahead of pointing out every mistake that they make. You need to put your love ahead of your irritations. See, when a marriage ends, oftentimes it ends with one or both people feeling a sense of bitterness or contempt. Researcher John Gottman has studied this extensively, and what Gottman found when he looked at couples was there's actually a four-cycle pattern. He says it begins with disappointment. So you have something in your marriage, and you go, man, I'm just disappointed about this. They weren't like this when we were dating. I mean, they've changed, and I don't like how they do this. I don't like how they do that. It's disappointment. But then that disappointment often leads to part two, which is frustration. And when you're in the frustration stage, you're going, you always, and you never, you start hearing those words thrown around your house, you know, we're in stage two, we're in frustration. And if that isn't dealt with, it's going to lead to part three, which is bitterness. And when you're in the bitterness stage, you're going, what is wrong with you? I mean, why did I even marry you in the first place? There's bitterness beginning to set in. And Gottman says that if those are unaddressed, it will lead to part four, which is contempt. Here's how Gottman defines contempt. He says it's an attitude of superiority. That when you start to look down on your spouse, when you start to call them names, when you start to point out every fault and every mistake, when you actually start to find joy when something bad happens to them, you have contempt. This, of course, is the opposite of love, and it's why people who are in that stage will say things like this, well, we're not in love. We fell out of love. I'm not sure we were ever in love in the first place. And the really scary part is they're not even sure how they got there. Here's how you got there. One disappointment at a time. One disappointment that you never addressed, that you never worked through. And there's really two ways to work through your disappointment. The first one is sit down and talk about it. 
And the second one is that you make a conscious decision to say, you know what, I'm going to choose to overlook this. I don't like it. It kind of irritates me. It kind of frustrates me. But because of our love, I am going to choose to overlook it. What if every single one of us here today sat down with God this week and we prayed and we talked to God about the things we loved about our spouse? And then we went and told our spouse what those were. And we said, you know what? I'm going to make a conscious effort that there's some things I'm going to overlook. I'm going to focus on the positives and appreciate those more than I even look at the negatives. Here's the third way that God can fix up your marriage. It's this. If you want what you once had, then you need to do what you once did. This is a principle that is so powerful for your marriage. If you want what you once had, then you need to do what you once did. Here's what happens to a lot of married couples. They meet, they date, and they go out to dinner, and they go to movies, and they go on walks, and they write each other little notes that call each other their little honey bunny oney bunches of oats, and they ask questions, and they try to build up this person and support their dreams, and then they get married, and they stop doing like half of those things. Ten years into the marriage, they go, well, why has the flame died out? I'll tell you why. It's because you stopped doing what you once did. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the church in Ephesus, and he accuses them of forgetting their first love. He says this. He says, you don't love me or each other as you did at first. And then he says, look at how far you have fallen from your first love. Maybe some of you would say that describes my marriage. That you would look at each other and you would say, look at how far we've fallen from our first love. But I want you to see what Jesus says in the next verse. He says, turn back to me again and work as you did at first. In other words, there's two ways that you can restore any relationship that has fallen away from love, whether it's a relationship with God, which is what he's talking about in this verse, or it's a relationship with your spouse. First, you need to turn back. Some of you turned away from your spouse. That there was something that frustrated you, something that disappointed you, and you just went, you know what? I can't deal with that right now. I'm done. I can't deal with that stress. I can't deal with the fighting. I can't deal with the arguing. I'm turning from you. And the first step is you need to turn back this week. Some of you turned away to another person or your career or your kids, and you need to turn back this week. But then look at what Jesus says next. He says, you need to do as you did at first. In other words, if you want what you once had, then you need to do what you once did. Just think about an average married couple for a moment. Their love is real. The wedding is beautiful. But now they're 10 years into their marriage. And they're just kind of doing life together. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a life born out of their love for each other. But it's somewhere along the line they started to forget. They started to forget why they love each other. And why they got married. And why they made certain sacrifices to build their family. The problem isn't hard-heartedness. The problem is forgetfulness. And it's as simple as just remembering. One of the best pieces of advice that my wife and I got when we were first married is to build some times into your relationship to remember. So we try to go on a date night once a week. And we'll sit across the dinner table and I'll just ask her questions like, how are you doing, really? And, And she'll ask me the same thing. And if we don't get a chance to go out to dinner, we'll just go for a walk around our neighborhood or have a snack after the kids go to bed. Doesn't have to be anything extravagant. And then once a year or so, we try to get a weekend away, just the two of us. And I'm telling you, every time we get a weekend away, there comes a moment when I will look at her and I will go, oh, I love her. And I remember why we got married and why we fell in love and why we want to spend the rest of our lives together. And all it took was some time with one another. Now, I'm not saying every time we go out to dinner or spend time with each other that we hear bells and whistles and violins are playing. We feel all warm and fuzzy. I think she probably does. (laughs) I don't necessarily always feel like that, but maybe she does. But, But every time we get some time alone, provided there's not a bigger issue that we need to address, I start to remember. What if you spent some time this week remembering? What if you went on a walk? What if you planned some fun dinner? What if you got the 
wedding album or some other picture albums out and you started to talk about the history that you have with each other and some of the wonderful moments along the way. If you did what you once did, you might just have what you once had. At all of our campuses, we're gonna pray together, but I'm gonna let you just remain seated for this. Because as we close out this five-week series, I wanted to pray for every single one of you and your relationships. And specifically after today's message, I wanted to pray for those of you who are married. And I realize that some of you have marriages that just, just need a fresh coat of paint. A couple little things maybe you need to work on and, and maybe just to start to spend a little more time or be a little more creative or a little more effort. And there are others of you who say, man, it's, it's hopeless. And I feel so stuck. And I really believe that there is a God who can do miracles in your life and who can do miracles in your marriage. And so I just wanna pray right now that God would work in your life and that God would work in your marriage. Let's pray together. God, I pray for every person here. God, first I start to just pray for those who are single. I pray, God, that they would have the patience to wait on the right person, a person who loves you and trusts you. You just keep reminding of them that, God, that you are with them, that you will love them. And that if they delight in you, you will give them the desires of their heart. God, I pray for those who have just gone through a breakup or a divorce. And the pain and the loneliness and the insecurity, God, I pray against that right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, God, I pray that you would comfort them. I pray that you would encourage them. And I pray that you would heal them. And God, for those who are married here, marriage is so hard sometimes. You get two sinful, selfish people together and it's so hard. But God, you design marriage. And you say, rejoice in the wife of your youth. Rejoice in the husband of your youth. God, I pray this week that we would just rejoice. That we would be grateful, thankful for their strengths and who they are. And we would be reminded of why we love them and why we fell in love and why we want to spend the rest of our lives together, God. And we would do whatever it takes. We would humble ourselves. We would do whatever it takes to see that that happens. God, we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer, come on down front, everyone. Otherwise, have a great day.